The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Our next speaker will be the uh, final speaker of the day. Uh, Bob Armbruster, uh, who I've known for quite a long time, he's president of the Armbruster Company. And Bob specializes in the restoration of historic architectural concrete sculpture and artwork, especially projects uh, by John J. Early. As mentioned by Sid previously, um, Bob is considered one of the top experts in early concrete and construction. Uh, Bob is past chairman of ACI 124, Concrete Aesthetics. And today he will show us how mosaic concrete murals are made using traditional methods of the early studio. Bob? Thanks, Paul. Well, usually we're asked to uh, help in restoring historic monuments, historic buildings. And it's rare that we're asked to uh, create new historic buildings. But that's what I'm going to talk about. And this is really what I think of it as a high art of concrete. This is, this is artistic concrete. And everyone today has been a great lead up for me because John J. Early, the man who made concrete beautiful, also created these polychrome mosaics. And as was mentioned, he came up with the idea of creating a mosaic effect by exposing the aggregates that he had already gap graded. So he was sizing the aggregates to look like the same size pebbles or mosaic tesserae. And he did this in precast concrete, cast in place concrete, and stucco. Now in 1922, his local parish church, which was the Basilica of the, of the Shrine of the Sacred Heart, was being finished on the outside, and they couldn't afford to do frescoes on the inside. And he offered to help out. And he came up with this idea of polychrome mosaics using many colored pieces of aggregate in the concrete mixture that he applied. These are, he did, as Sid mentioned, with uh, colored stone, colored glass, colored ceramic pieces crushing them, screening them to the same size. You can kind of see the lines between the colors. Those are grooves, which was the method he used to keep the colors apart. Uh, five years later, 1927, he did some incredible mosaic illustrations on the reptile house at the National Zoo. The surrounding um, architectural banding was largely colored stone and, and colored ceramics. But he did use glass up for the dinosaur and the uh, uh, scene. Now these are done with tesserae or stones about one quarter of an inch in size. However, the last work that they did of this type was 1968. And it's out in Honolulu, which was not yet a state. And that's why it was able to host a national cemetery outside the continental United States. And this is where there's a national memorial for the Pacific Wars. And early studios was asked to, to as for a design build contract, to create murals that are called battle maps. These are 10 feet high and they tell the story of the pro progress of the battles throughout World War II, and it also included the Korean War. He in, embedded, they embedded thousands of letters and hundreds of ceramic symbols in the maps to t for the uh, telling the story. It's at what's, what's called the Punchbowl Cemetery. It's actually in the city of Honolulu, 
And it's an extinct volcano that was used by the uh, native Hawaiians for uh, burials themselves in, in ancient times, or ancient old times. Um, it is a national historic landmark. The cemetery goes throughout the bowl, and from the entrance point at the far end on the rise of the edge of the bowl is the memorial. And that there is a long stairway going up. On each side are called courts of the missing. And they have tens of thousands of names engraved on there of missing uh, military personnel through those wars. And at the very top, they have uh, map galleries on each side of a center chapel, which is the tall structure. Now, being a National Historic Site, there, it actually took longer to work out and get all the approvals for adding on a new Vietnam Memorial than the time we had to fabricate it and build it. And uh, this is the first federally funded uh, v memorial to the Vietnam War. Uh, the great uh, memorial in Washington, D.C. was entirely paid for by donations from citizens and organizations. These panels, as I mentioned, the maps are about 10 feet high. They were made up by creating th precast panels about three foot wide, five feet tall, and two inches thick using, as you've seen today, this, this MOSI method or early method of a face mix and a backup mix. They used more than 100 colors of glass and stone to create the artwork. The uh, interesting thing here is the pebbles are only one-eighth of an inch in size. So in other words, there's four times as much detail as the other mosaics. I didn't realize that when I bid the job, but so I was a little overwhelmed when I first looked at it. And as you can see in the detail of the eagle, the effect of having this glass in different orientations, largely flat against the surface, but with the different thickness of the glass, you get more light going in, so there's some more transparency or less. You get various shades in the glass. They used pigments, and the sand was also crushed and screened glass as well. So they would combine different colors of glass. They would use different colors of sand, different colors of pigments to create these wonderful artistic effects. This panel is about 20 inches wide, 24 to 26 inches tall, uses about 20 different concrete mixtures to create the effects. The ships in the um, uh, overall map are ceramic inserts, glazed ceramic. And as you can see in the detail, by blending in bits of other colors, they very artistically created a, a uh, a mosaic rendering using concrete. The way they did that, the American Battle Monuments Commission, which is a part of the executive branch or a commission appointed by the uh, president, worked with early studios. Um, that's Richard Adams in the, in the uh, shirt sleeves with the t white shirt and tie. And you can see some of the generals and, and commissioners meeting at early studios. I know that's early studios because on the wall is one of early studios uh, presidential or seals of the United States, the great seal. They made dozens of these and they went out to all the embassies around the world when they made them. They kept one in their office. <laughs> And uh, the woman there is the artist that early studios hired, Mary, Jacob, Mary Morris Jacobs. And uh, she created the artwork for these murals. And that, and that photograph, by the way, she's standing on some of the precast panels in early studios' yard. She drew full-size painted drawings of all of these panels, including the text where the ceramic inserts went, all the different colors. She did the research for the artwork itself, for the equipment. She went out and climbed up in tanks and planes just to check them out. And uh, she created watercolor studies. And then behind her is the acrylic, uh, what I call a mosaic drawing. And it, if you looked at it, you'd think it's sort of a paint by numbers because each color is a fairly monochrome color, each area of color. 
Early, she then took the, this to Early Studios, who was her client, and they selected from the different colors of aggregate that Early had what colors to use. You can see the letters T, U, and so on. And then Early Studios took that drawing and created, and you can see right next to it, the final uh, mosaic artwork panel. Here's how they did it. From Mary's acrylic mosaic drawing, which was the correct orientation, it looked the way she wanted it on the wall, and that's what the uh, commissioners approved. They had early studios artists identified the lines separating each color, and they used what's called a ponce tool, which is a uh, uh, it's like a pointer with a rotating wheel on the end, and the wheel has teeth. You rub it along the line, it punctures through the drawing. As Mary said, they ruined my drawings. And it creates indentations in the plaster slab. They then remove her drawing and put uh, chalk to identify those holes, and then use the scribing tool to, to carve grooves along every line. Those grooves are about one-eighth of an inch deep. They then put a mold release agent and cast another plaster mold on top of that model. So they then had, as you see in number four, they had a plaster mold that they would use for casting the concrete. They used a form release agent. Um, we know that they also used a retarder, although they never admitted that, but I'm getting some of their actual in-house papers and um, practice uh, procedures, we, we, we knew they used the retarder. You can see the, uh, the craftsmen using artist tools to in install the concrete mixtures. Um, it's hard to make out the ceramic shapes are in place on that mold. Finally, they, they get it out of the mold, they expose the, all that glass, and they have number five, the mosaic panel. This is an enlargement of that installation. They used wood framed perimeter for their plaster molds. And it was a very slow, tedious process, as I'll show you. Now, our instructions were, because the part of the commission's objective was to make this appear to be one monument. They wanted to be consistent with the historic murals in the style of the murals, the colors of the murals, the material of the murals, the techniques that were used. So um, we went out and measured what we could. We couldn't take samples, of course. So we used uh, hundreds of color calibrated actual scale photographic prints back in our studio. I made a set of those same prints for the artists to work with in order to try to match the same colors and same size. On the right side is one of the new maps. The Vietnam maps were much smaller in total area, so we had to squeeze the artwork in and, and overlay the land a lot more. Now, fortunately, Mary Morris Jacobs is still alive. She's 89, and the commission, before we got involved, had hired her as the consulting artist. So Mary did small watercolors, like on a sketch pad, for these different scenes, we then translated that into the mosaic drawing and on into the molds and so on. You can see up on the upper right, uh, our studio staff meeting with Mary and the uh, project architect and the, and the commissioner staff. As we go over, you know, is this the right piece of, we had to work with his, the historians from all the military agent forces for the, is this the right historical equipment? Which uh, aircraft carrier should be shown and so on. And there in the lower right you can see the mosaic artwork for the scene. From that artwork, once we had the artwork approved, we then used this time software. We had less than half of the time for our production that early studios had. So we couldn't use the plaster slab method. Um, it just didn't have time. So we used the software and the computer to not only create the mosaic drawing, but then to create, we used a, a CAM computer-aided computer machining software to create the lines and use that to machine the mold directly so we didn't have to go through a multi-step casting process and then a CNC router to machine the ridges that are 
coming up out of the face of our, our mold. We also had to create over 450 different mosaic concrete mixtures for color, and we used those with the approved drawings to select the, the mixtures for the colors. Then we had a um, specification sheet that identified all the different color concrete mixtures that we were going to use. We created full-size colored shop drawings with the mixture number in every area because it got very confusing trying to keep track of what color went where. And the lower right you can see as, the, as it's progressing, the lines between the colors start to get blurred because the first mix that goes in, you have to keep it below the top of the ridge. The second mix goes up over the ridge and over the, the first color so that you have some thickness to that, that color coat. Because when you expose it, of course, the ridges, you don't want to show the uh, backup mix where the ridge is. Uh, on the upper left, you can see it as we're placing the concrete into the mold. And the, and in the large one is when we take it out of the mold. It's very chalky, pasty, cement-looking because we have not exposed the aggregate. But you can clearly see the, the grooves that are left where the ridges were. We used a high-density urethane uh, foam for the molds and a retarder that we sprayed on, a foam retarder. Here you can see Mary's small water sketch and a photograph of the final mosaic uh, panel up in place. The grooves create a three-dimensional kind of bas-relief effect, which is, you wouldn't think an eighth of an inch groove would create that much difference, but it really has, it visually, as you walk along, you get a, a wonderful effect, the light and the shadow. Some of the details, because we had so little room, like the uh, harness on the, on the oxen, that's only one aggregate wide. So we had to size all these areas in the translating her drawings so that we were sure we could actually get aggregates into the details we were placing the concrete. So while the artwork was being developed, we started creating we create dozens of samples, just the different amounts of pigment that we had to work with. We had uh, uh, about 24 pigments. We tested about 250 glass uh, colors that we could get from uh, not only there's a few suppliers for the um, concrete industry that have glass aggregate and terrazzo industry, but mainly from the art glass industry. And fortunately, we didn't have to import it from uh, Italy. There's some good sources here in the United States. This top picture shows you what we can do with one shade of mint green glass. Different pigments um, create a different shade of green as you go across. So that's how we fine tune these colors for the artwork. And of course, we had hundreds of uh, samples and mixes to keep track of all the ingredients. Then we had to calculate the areas for every color on the map because we couldn't order the glass until we knew the total area of that glass in the full map uh, project. Because it, when you buy, as glass is produced, it comes out of the, the firing furnace in different colors, in different shades. So we had to buy it out of one fire. So we had to calculate how much do we have to crush and screen to get the amount we need for all the mixes. And of course, we also had to know for every day of casting how much do we have to prepare. We used, we had to set up our own crushing and screening operation, and we used a small jaw crusher, a laboratory screener, and then I fabricated a larger screener for the larger quantities. Finally, we had our raw material, shelves of different colors of glass, all coated and uh, tracked so that we could, could use what we needed. For the ceramic inserts on the original map, they, they used basically one color along with white, for the ships and, and emblems. For the Vietnam War, because it was a different kind of war and there weren't fronts, they decided that it would be more appropriate to use the unit patches of the different uh, uh, groups in the armed forces. So now we had multicolored ceramic inserts in different shapes. And for that, we actually decided to use a porcelain, rather more durable, and um, created a, a uh, cutting template, 
went through a seven-step process of drying and firing and gl preliminary glazing and final glazing. Fortunately, the digital printing process has come to the glaze industry. So we were able to get, these are actual glass glazes printed digitally based on our artwork. For the letters, we had to match the fonts in the original uh, map, and I believe they used those uh, systems for the bulletin boards where they put little plastic letters in the grooves. But they, they had dozens of fonts back then. We only had two that we could find that we could purchase, and of course they didn't match the historic ones. So we had to find the right font, go through the typesetting and graphic uh, process, and then machine about 5,000 letters. So we did this in a, in a marine-grade acrylic, machined the front, machined the back, opened everything up, I kept keeping ribs, and then cut the words apart. And that's the uh, uh, face mold being machined on the router. It took about two days to pre-batch all the materials for one three-foot by five-foot panel. We had to get a, a special scale because the pigments had to be measured sometimes to the one hundredth of a gram in order to keep consistency. Now these mixes, we had nine different ingredients. We used a 25% pozzolan in addition to a white Portland cement. We often had two or three colors of glass as well as two different pigments in there. And we used a super plasticizer. Our Water cement ratio was about a 0.33, which is surprising, but we can do that with our modern chemicals. For mixing, because we had such small mixes sometimes, that's about a half a cup mix. By the way, some of the glass aggregate was $45 a pound in the raw material, and we needed uh, to crush that, and we'd only get, it would be $95 per pound by the time we were, we were done processing and with all the waste. So we used a uh, laboratory bone homogenizer mixer that had enough torque and, and power to, to do that. But it still was a 20-minute mixing regimen of uh, uh, just like you would do with a good concrete mix to do it. We placed the material and consolidated it with uh, artist palette knives into the little grooved areas, uh, a tedious process but uh, it worked. It would take usually seven to eight of us working from 10 to 12 hours in a day to do one precast panel when we, could get, when we got to that point. However, uh, we could only, in terms of time, mix and place about 25 colors. So on some panels that had 35 to 40 colors, we had to do the artwork as separate inserts. Those are half inch thick with a fiber reinforced backup mix in there. Uh, done everything like we did normal casting and, and that. And then we put a clay, natural clay on the face of that panel, laid it into a pocket in the mold, kept it flat and moist while we placed all the other materials around, around it. And when we exposed everything, it, it was flush with the face and it looked like it had been placed originally. We used stainless steel pins to regist for registration of all the letters. So we had holes in the letter acrylic grid and in the mold. And then we had pockets we machined in the mold to fit the porcelain inserts to hold them in registration. And as more and more colors were placed, you begin to fill in around the letters and fill in around the uh, porcelain patches. Finally, we, we had all of those face colors in place, consolidated, and we put the reinforcing steel, the, including the lifting anchors and the uh, uh, anchors for attachment to the structure. We used a very similar backup mix, but instead of glass, we used a granite aggregate. Uh, but very similar properties because we didn't want um, really thermal differences. The next day we removed it from the mold, set it up on our, our uh, this time we sit, sit instead of a, uh, a timber frame, we used a steel frame. <laughs> and this is how it looked before exposing started. We, we used uh, nylon and um, brass wire and even some steel wire brushes, size of toothbrushes 
for exposing the colors. Uh, by the way, when, when you're doing this, um, some of the first colors that were placed the morning before are already quite hard, and the last colors that were placed are much softer because they haven't been curing as long. So you have to work the colors depending on which ones are, are, are most hard and go in that sequence. We use dental tools to clean out the grooves. And just as Sid pointed out, uh, they, they uh, did that, uh, the filling, the smearing to fill in the little holes. Well, we had a problem because some of the interior openings in the letters were just smaller than we, than we could get a, a piece of glass in from the back. So we, we had to go through that same kind of smearing process with, with a, uh, basically a mortar mix, the same as, as we had for the concrete. Our curing was to wrap it uh, over the stainless steel tub, which had some water in it, and we'd go through seven days of moist curing. On the second day, we'd pull it out and we'd do that weak acid wash, and that removed that cement film. It's not exposing the aggregate, but it's taking off the a little thin haze. Put it back in for wet curing, seven days of dry curing, when we had enough panels done, we could assemble them on the floor of the studio, check for the alignment, check make sure colors worked. We, uh, uh, the, the artwork was so late getting approved that we went from an eight-month production schedule down to three months. So uh, they did give us an extra to the contract to air freight these to Hawaii, which is interesting. And then the... Uh, uh, masons installed them up onto the structural concrete. The deadline was Veterans Day, November 11th of last year, and that's when they, they dedicated the new Vietnam Memorial. It was a wonderful ceremony. This shows on the top one of the historic eagles in one of the panels, and this, she, she used this at the top of some of the paragraph panels. And everyone thought, of course, they're delightful, um, that it would be good to use it on new panels because it would t help, again, tie it together. In the center, and because that artwork was set by the existing panels, we, we actually used a photograph to create our own artwork. We didn't have to wait. So that was the first thing. The middle photo shows the first test sample we made, and of course the colors were too bright. Everybody realized that, but everything else worked pretty well. So then we went through adjusting our colors and the whole, whole process, and the bottom shows the final panel with the, the eagle up on the Vietnam Memorial. In the lower left, you can see when um, the, some of the commission staff and the architect and Mary came out to our studio in order to look at the, that was actually the first mock-up but it turned out so well that we were able to use it in the project, so that was nice. This is what uh, you get in this mosaic concrete. There are black sands with uh, white aggregate, with gray aggregate. There's white sands with black aggregate. It's just remarkable. Um, and those pebbles are one-eighth of an inch in size, so it's terrific detail, a lot of light and shadow. Um, and it, it was kind of fun talking about, well, what should we use for the uh, center of the compass rose? You know, should it be a cannon? Should it be a tank? Should it be a plane? And, and so on. Now, part of the challenge is to keep the artwork crossing the joints between the panels flowing smoothly. And um, the software, of course, helps tremendously because that's a good guy. But you have to really be disciplined, too. And in the detail, you can see that the, the results were very successful. This shows some of the text on the historic panel and on the new panel. Similar ocean background. They wanted a similar font. They wanted similar spacing and sizing and so on. Uh, this is a close-up of the text. Um, it turned out quite well. We were, we were very pleased. You can see that's actually one blue aggregate but it looks dark blue, light blue, a little gray, all because of the orientation of the, of the, of the glass and the thickness of the glass in the individual particles. Here it is with the marble cladding surrounding it and uh, covering the structure and, and the visitors there looking at it. Um, everyone felt that it was very effective. I have to tell you, when I, when I was there for the installation, I met 
the head of the historical society in Hawaii. And, of course, I was introduced to her as, as having fabricated design and fabricated the maps, was there for the installation, and she had a very stern look, and uh, she goes, well, I hope they are okay. I hope we're going to be happy. Uh, she had given a lot of, they had really given a, a lot of review to what needed to be there to maintain this historic landmark. So I was very pleased the day of the dedication when it was finally unveiled, and she said, they're great. So <laughs> you never know. But that's uh, using modern science and some modern technology, but really historic techniques to create what we think will be new historic uh, landmarks and monuments. So. Does anybody have any, oh. does anybody have any questions for Bob? No, they were they were using uh, a white Portland cement. Actually, for, it was made by Atlas at the time. Uh, when we're doing, and the question came up earlier about additives and some of these historic repairs, we're very careful because as as we shift the cements, uh, or we get into latex or acrylic additives or some even some other, um, we have to be careful even in some of the plasticizers. You can create change the appearance when it between wet and dry. So uh, in this case, we wanted to, to stay with the Portland cement. We were very concerned about the alkali silica reaction. And so in our, in our preparation bidding process, we asked Wiss Janey to join our team to provide the material testing. And we tested uh, pozzolans at 15% and at 25%. And the 15% didn't, and we took what we thought would be the worst color from historical glass, uh, and the 15% the didn't do the job, and the 25% it did it just kind of enough. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, but it was it was a straight, you know, it was a white Portland cement. We had to be very careful with the additives as well because of the color. Uh, it was uh, VCAS is the product name, and we, um, it is a ground fiberglass, finely ground uh, fiberglass, and the whole concept is it creates an immediate reaction. The alkali silica reaction creates the expansive gels right away so that within the first hours you get that and you, you don't have it occurring later. So... Um, but it was it was the whitest product and the best for color control that we could find. Well, that that's that's the uh, that's what we tested for, and there there is a there there is a, a test where you can test the mixture in an accelerated um, test. So we were able. Because, of, because there was that test, to actually test the exact products that we were going to use and see what happened. So that, yeah, we, that was the concern. We had that reaction, but, uh, not only potentially, but real, between the glass aggregate and the uh, alkalis in the cement. And by adding the pozzolans, we muted that so that it was at least uh, a more level curve as it went out instead of a rising curve. Yeah. And, it, and we also realize it's it's a fairly thin, um, very dense. The, the glass, uh, what John Early did was he figured out the least amount of sand to add to just fill in between the pebbles that are already touching. So that was his concept. So the, these mixes are very dense in, in the packing of the large aggregate. You get very little shrinkage, surprisingly. When we first started this, we couldn't get pieces out of a mold with normal draft. It just it didn't shrink enough to break the the uh, vacuum from from that. So uh, our molds had to be more complex. But the uh, we so we felt not only with the pozzolans but with this dense packing of the aggregate that we had done our best. We also had the the 50 year old maps murals to go by the mosaic murals and. 
they didn't use any Poslins. They used straight Portland, and there was no damage. The Hawaii climate is very consistent. Uh, freeze thaw wasn't an issue. We didn't have to worry about air entrainment. Uh, they're in a, a gallery that's covered uh, except for one open side. I think it's rare if they even get rain. So, uh, and, uh, so the, the existing maps are in superb condition. Um, uh, they're, they're dusty and dirty. We're, we actually are going back Wednesday. I'll, I'll be going back with the crew, and we're going to clean and do a little restoration. The, the maintenance over the years has been a little bit of damage, to most, particularly the ceramics and a few areas. So we're going to go back and take care of the World War II and, and Korean War uh, mosaics next month. Uh, thank everybody for coming.